Thanks for clicking into this week's THA Capital Update. We have a number of important issues to bring up. Obviously, there's plenty of health care in the news this week, especially as the national spotlight narrows on Texas uh, in response to the West explosion that uh, has prominently featured a number of uh, hospitals that stepped up to the plate and performed well to uh, respond uh, to the trauma and the tragedy that's occurred there. Of course, we have Senate Bill 303 and the Advanced Directives uh, Bill will provide an update on that and everything that's happened there. It passed the Senate this week, 24 to 6. We'll also go over the Medicaid expansion update. House Bill 3791 goes to uh, the House Appropriations Committee. We'll detail that for you. House conferees were set by House Speaker Joe Strauss on April 22nd. THA reached out to conferees this week, encouraging them to fully fund the Medicaid DISH program by allocating $175 million in state general revenue funds in state fiscal year 2013. Stick around, we'll be right back. All right, with us today we have uh, John Hawkins. We've uh, had a busy uh, week, uh, obviously lots of the the, the news uh, that's been going on around uh, the explosion in West, but uh, also, you know, st still things are moving here at the Capitol, including uh, some, some movement on Medicaid, um, which should culminate uh, this week as, as the uh, House Appropriations Committee meets about House Bill 3791 by uh, John Zerwas. Yeah, I think it's uh, some important progress on the, on the Medicaid expansion issue. Uh, House Bill 3791 was heard in a House Appropriations Subcommittee. John Zerwas laid that out, really the Texas solution to Medicaid as he's called it. Uh, the bill says, you know, um, we ought to go for a block grant, recognizing that that's probably not viable politically in the short term. Uh, he uh, proposes a solution where we do really uh, more coverage expansion. And I think they were very clear in that hearing that we need to stop talking about Medicaid expansion and be talking about coverage expansion. And so what his bill does is propose using the federal funds that are allocated for the Medicaid expansion uh, to use those federal funds but use them in a way that uh, expands private market coverage through subsidy for that population that was targeted for the Medicaid expansion. And it's really even in the bill he recognizes the fact that the, there's aspects of Medicaid that needs to be fixed as far as its growth uh, is concerned, uh, that they, they want to implement a number of these measures in order to give taxpayer relief uh, in local markets. So it, it does provide an indication that they understand that that, that coverage is still important. Um, but uh, how we get there is something that's still to be played with. Right, and I think he's trying to divorce the discussion, he and the leadership, from you know, all the ills of the current Medicaid system. And obviously that's a very different population, the aged, blind, and disabled, and pregnant women and children, uh, you know, to try to, 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 to divorce the criticism of, uh, of really the cost of those programs, divorce that from what really is an opportunity to create a new system for uh, the working poor, folks that, that um, you know, need a benefit package that's closer to the benchmark uh, commercial package in the state. So it's, it's really an opportunity to design a new system, I think, is what the messaging needs to be. And I think that you made that clear in, in your testimony that, uh, you know, again, it doesn't have to look like the Affordable Care Act and uh, the way it kind of laid out the uh, Medicaid expansion and the proposal. It can be that Texas solution based on whatever legislators do want to design. Yeah, and again, you know, I reminded them that during the debate on ACA at the federal level, we certainly advocated for less reliance on Medicaid, more private market subsidy, uh, because that works better for hospitals. It works better for individuals because of the personal responsibility piece. So, uh, again, our message continues to be what we need is coverage expansion. We shouldn't necessarily get wrapped around the axle about how we get there. Uh, if these federal funds are available, which, by the way, we're financing a large share of that already through payment cuts, uh, we need to be able to access those federal funds to create a system that works for Texas. Okay, great. So uh, added to that, more money uh, issues on the table. We've got uh, the, the Senate passed its budget, budget weeks ago, but now conferees have been uh, named that will come together with House conferees and they'll, they'll hash out a plan moving forward. Right. So the you know, next uh, 30 days, the conference committee will meet to uh, negotiate the budget. Um, Again, we, uh, THA, uh, continues to advocate for the need to, to, for the state uh, to put up uh, $175 million uh, in 2013, $150 million going forward in, in 14 and 15. 
uh, to make sure we uh, fully fund the, the DISH program for hospitals. So that'll be our, our priority issue for conference committee. Okay. Well, it's uh, a full list of things. And again, uh, we encourage uh, our, our uh, Texas hospital leaders to uh, engage with THA and, and their own legislators if uh, uh, they can help us move the, the needle on some of these issues. And uh, we appreciate your time on this. Thank you. Uh, we have Carrie Kroll joining us this week. Obviously, she's going to be giving us an update on the advanced directives legislation. That's Senate Bill 303 that passed in the Senate last week, 24 to 6, um, with uh, no debate really on the floor about it. And uh, what happened and how did the bill change and, and what does it include now as it's moving forward? Sure. It is quite remarkable, of course, that there was no debate. I mean, it's a highly contentious issue. So that, uh, I think, is a testament to how much work went into the front end of things. Um, stakeholders have been working for months. Um, the hospital association has been working with the Texas bishops, the medical association, and others, Texas Alliance for Life, um, on, on putting it together. The change really that happened in the Senate was in response to what Senator Duell was hearing from both the disabled community and the Texas Right to Life organization was change the number of days to transfer. So current statute is 10 days. The legislation as filed, 303, is 14, and the bill that passed yesterday in the Senate is 21 days. And that basically gives anyone that's challenging a do not attempt resuscitation order uh, 21 days to find a transferring facility, a facility to transfer that patient to if, if they're Right. It's the once the Ethics Committee has made their decision um, to either stop the um, medical treatment that's currently um, taking place or the family has that amount of time to find an, an, another willing provider. And so kind of before that though, the bill also outlines a step-by-step -step process for the role of the hospital, the role Absolutely. of the patient and family for an appeal. We've got those details on the website and you can click to those uh, right here in the, in the podcast webpage. But um, can you, is there any way to kind of surmise that as far as bullets go? Absolutely. I mean, the bill really for the first time sets out a process for establishing do not resuscitate or do not attempt resuscitation orders. And it also, uh, for the first time, although a lot of our hospitals are doing this, sets up a process where families can have a sort of advisor walk them through the process. So this is going to be a social worker or some other employee with the facility that can really help families as they sort to deal with the, the medical situation of their loved one and, and discuss next steps. And that, that'll be good as far as outlining that, that, that clarity for hospitals too, to, you know, this is, it's a very stressful time for a family. Absolutely. And this is intended to be a roadmap to make things more clear, both from the physician, hospital side of things, and the family surrogate side. What's the next step for that legislation? So it goes to the House, and it'll go through the same process. Um, the House author or sponsor is Representative Susan King from Abilene. It'll be referred, most likely, uh, to the House Public Health Committee, and so I expect another week or two we should see a committee hearing on that bill. Okay, well, uh, some other uh, uh, elements in the news. Uh, we brought you in to talk about some of the uh, the issues that's uh, occurred with the response in wet or near West. Um, obviously, you cover uh, trauma trauma issues as part of uh, your your responsibilities for the organization, and it was really interesting this week to see our Texas hospitals really step up and shine brightly Absolutely. in the national national spotlight. Absolutely, I think that we had um, the. The wonderful thing about the trauma network is it exists. It's one of those things that you don't need it till you need it, and then it needs to work well. And we saw that, um, you know, when the port started coming in late in the night, uh, it was almost instantaneously that some of our CEOs were on the news directing people to information about where um, people who were victims of the explosion in West had been taken. And I think it's uh, very indicative of the fact that, that the trauma system works and there's a process to make sure patients get from point A to point B very quickly. We've got a list of those hospitals on our uh, Capital Update podcast webpage, but just to kind of go through them quickly, you had, you had Hillcrest, um, they had about 28 patients that were admitted and continued to receive care as of uh, Thursday. And then you had uh, five of those were in ICU, 12 were elderly, elderly patients who were treated and released. Uh, we believe, as we were told uh, from the hospital, those were the, the elderly patients that were in the, the nursing, home. nursing home near the blast site. 50 other patients there were treated and released. They also had treated, uh, had transported uh, several patient, pediatric patients to their children's hospital. That's McLean Children's uh, mm -hmm. in Temple. Parkland had two patients. Baylor uh, Waxahachie had three. Uh, both of those uh, hospitals treated and released those patients. 
Providence in Waco is mm -hmm. the other hospital that took a large population of uh, patients, 68, uh, mostly minor to moderate injuries, one in critical condition. And then one of the interesting ones that, that I called and I had heard through the grapevine that was Hill Regional Hospital in Hillsboro, mm -hmm. a small community hospital just... Uh, Absolutely, but they're level four trauma center. Mm -hmm. So they were established with those protocols to be able to step in and, and start taking patients. It's interesting if you watch it, it kind of goes up the I-35 corridor towards Dallas. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not so much I, south other than um, obviously the Waco. Yeah, I talked to one example. of the uh, administrators to get an update on Thursday after the, the incident and uh, they had uh, treated 42 patients, treated and released. They were actually going into a debriefing as I talked to them and we're pretty proud of um, the response mm -hmm. that they had. And really too, you know, as we communicated with these, uh, with these hospital leaders, they, they told us, you know, that about the turnout of their hospital um, medical staffs, mm -hmm. had the, all of them just started pouring in to the point of, um, you know, having to say, okay, we've got enough staff and uh, cycling them. Yeah, I think um, the important thing right now is that um, the community is being served. We certainly want to make sure that all the people that were injured or hurt and even people that, you know, watched what happened, that they get the resources that they need. Um, but the, the second piece at some point will stop step back and start to evaluate is that um, the trauma system exists for these purposes and um, like it or not we're in the middle of a legislative session and there are bills that directly impact or could directly impact the trauma system and so when you look at level four facilities like Hill Regional there's legislation out there, Senate Bill 830 in the Senate, that actually has been recommended for the local calendar that would say that you no longer have to have an on-site physician to do treatment. It could be all done uh, or basically you could start treatment via telemedicine. There would be no longer a requirement for an on on-site physician, and that's of concern, especially for level four facilities like Hill that are that are responding in the way that they are. Um, and in addition, there's the bill that we've talked about several times related to the driver responsibility program. And it, it, it would obviously impact this as well because it, it seeks right now in the committee substitute to place a moratorium on the direct funding from the driver responsibility mm -hmm. program to the Texas trauma system. And so we'll, we'll have that uh, really some, we'll need to be calling on hospital leaders to, to help uh, touch base with their legislators. We'll be doing the same thing, obviously, to make sure that, uh, that, that we can maintain that driver's responsibility program. It's a good source of revenue in a time when we really don't need to be uh, shying away from any uh, existing sources. Right. I mean, we, it, the dedicated funding is there. Uh, the legislation that passed House Bill 104 basically says, uh, okay, we're just going to stop collections as of September 1st, 2013, and try to find an additional way to fund it. And if we don't, we may start it up again in 2015. And for those of us who have been watching the process for a while, there's not, they're not throwing money at a lot of stuff right now. Um, and it's nice to have a dedicated pot of dollars that we can go to and uh, just basically expect to help fund the trauma system. Well, great. I appreciate that. Um, and we'll expect you back here uh, next week, potentially Happy. for another update. So we appreciate it. Thanks for clicking into this week's THA Capital Update podcast. Always plenty of information in our newsroom web pages and also on the uh, Advocate web page where you have our newsletter that we send out weekly. And we appreciate you uh, checking it out.